My name is Shirley Tillman, and I am here with three colleagues who have been working over the past year and a half to try and think through some of the changes that have occurred in biomedical research since we began our careers some time ago. Uh, this began uh, with a breakfast uh, with my colleague Mark Kirshner at Harvard, where we came to uh, concerns about the system that were based on, on two observations. A long-standing concern of mine had been the growing length of training for young biomedical scientists, both graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, and the current observation that many of them who are achieving faculty jobs are achieving those jobs at the age of 37 on average and receiving their first R01 grants at the age of 42. As I began to talk to Mark about some of these problems that I perceive in the system, he then identified other issues that I think are just as serious. And I'm going to turn to Mark and ask him if he'd be willing to talk about them. Well, thank you, Shirley. I, I've been concerned as well about the problems that Shirley has, although she's thought about the economic issues uh, much more deeply and for much longer than I have. My concerns were uh, that many of the preconditions for good science that have been here for, have been known for hundreds of years, that is sort of freedom of inquiry, uh, allowing iconoclasts to explore their own directions, uh, free communication of ideas, um, just a, so, so enough security to be able to carry out the work you need to carry out. Um, that has been really uh, uh, threatened in, in many cases, uh, almost uh, completely abridged by a kind of hyper-competition that has arisen out of this, this now decreased number of resources that have gone into the system and an increased number of people chasing those resources. As a result, uh, we find uh, the journal system, for example, broken. That we, papers are now take years to prepare and, year, and even sometimes a year or more to review uh, graduate training is lengthened, postdoctoral training is lengthened. Uh, grant reviews, um, a, a system that, you know, was, we all believed was the best of all possible systems, but never perfect, worked well enough when the pay lines were 35%, but don't work very well when they're under, when they're under 10%. And in fact, it's not just where we're only taking 10% out of the 35%. Uh, people that we would normally have taken before. It's that his focus again on very risk averse kind of science, a kind of situation where one person who doesn't understand the grant very well can sink a grant, uh, and a kind of um, a misunderstanding that the opportunities that exist in translational research means that everybody should be doing translational research, which I don't think was ever the intention of even the people who proposed it. And uh, that has distorted the scientific community, added lots of stress in the system, ultimately made it less productive, and made it less attractive to the most entrepreneurial and thoughtful and imaginative people that have characterized American science for a long time. Uh, that was kind of a little bit of a, a, a repeat of the conversation that Shirley and I had. And we realized that this conversation really needed to be enlarged by people who would have felt knew much more than the two of us. We knew, we knew, knew a lot more than the two of us. And so um, the first person we, we turned to was, was Bruce Alberts. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we call ourselves the Gang of Four. <laughs> but the, the whole effort here, we wrote a paper that was published in April in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The whole effort is to start a much wider conversation with many more people and to uh, raise the consciousness of the community to what we see as a major threat to the future of American science, which is basically that, that we have prospered in this country and we're famous for the fact that the best young people get a chance to explore their own ideas at an early age. I think all of us had our own laboratories when we were in our 20s, uh, late 20s. Uh, now, as Shorty said, I mean, it's, it's, it's getting to the point where you're, at, you're, you're, you're almost at the middle of your career before you get a chance, or the end, even near the end of your career by the time you get a chance to have your own ideas expressed. And in fact, the system doesn't 
you know, re re really adequately reward new ideas. And so what I tell graduate students, I, an ideal world would be when you get your PhD, you think about what mystery, what, what uh, really important biological problem, we're all biologists, you, you want to solve. And then you see, well, I have these tools from my training in the lab that I got my PhD in, and now I want to take a 30 short postdoc to learn some new technologies that nobody else can, can use with my background. And then I could do something unique to tackle this problem. What you want really is exploring the, what I call the white spaces. I write a cell biology textbook and every time we write it, we become very aware that many areas are overcrowded and many other very important problems are very much under research with modern techniques. And that's because of the inertia in our system. That People feel forced to go on and do what they already did in order to get funded. So the real dilemma that we're trying to solve is how can we uh, create a system where the best young people have a chance to explore really creative ideas uh, at an age, some late 20s or, or 30s, uh, independent of anybody else and with, with, the, with the, the ability to take risks that are essential to doing good science. Uh, and my colleague, <laughs> very fortunate to have my colleague here, Harold Barmus, uh, who is actually inside one of the major institutions that has to react to this problem, the National Institutes of Health. And uh, without him, I think we'd just be whistling in the dark. <laughs> well, I'm not so sure of that one. Um, so for reasons that my colleagues have laid out, uh, we felt that it was worth bringing our anxieties about the current state of biomedical research which have occurred in the context of an incredibly triumphant march through recent history in which uh, American science, especially in the biomedical sphere, has um, made so many important contributions and entered a, an extraordinary age in which genomics and mass spectroscopy and many other new methodologies are transforming our ability to understand uh, biological systems and improve health. Um, that the sense that we are plagued by uh, opportunities that uh, can't be uh, completely uh, paid for uh, with current funding and uh, an, a, a, an event that has uh, compromised the, the environment in which we work. We all started our work at a time when it was possible to, to obtain funding and feel pretty comfortable about the way in which we work. And the, the, comp the competitive atmosphere in which we now are obliged to work has affected many of the of the conditions that were required for, for excellent science. So as someone who runs an institute that gives out a lot of the grants that support such research, uh, we all feel, at least we at the, at the NIH and the, my, my colleagues uh, in, in this uh, interview, um, are concerned about uh, trying to restore conditions uh, back to something that resembles a, a, the situation that obtained when, when the, the, the dollars were adequate to the task. So while we uh, applaud the efforts to, uh, to obtain more money from Congress to support our efforts, we also feel that there are things that can be done uh, by well-intentioned people to improve those atmospherics. We've just concluded a two-day meeting, which uh, people we've invited from many sectors of uh, our enterprise have debated the issues for a couple of days and uh, recognized that uh, there is a threat to the productivity of uh, of our community, especially among young investigators. And we are now going to spend the next several months thinking about how to take advantage of these new ideas and, uh, uh, and develop a broader consensus by hearing from yet more constituencies and uh, establish a firmer dialogue with many, many components of the, the research world. You know, the four of us were the beneficiaries of a, of a grand vision for scientific research in the 20th century that was uh, penned by Vannevar Bush back in the late 1940s called Science the Endless Frontier. It laid out basically the blueprint that we have followed ever since where we united the scientific research with the training of the next generation of scientists. And I think we feel that, there, that this is the moment where perhaps there needs to be a renewal of that great vision, that contract uh, with America um, 
as someone who was away from science for the last 12 years and has just come back in, I am stunned by the discoveries that have happened in just that short period of time where I was not paying close attention. That's the source of my optimism for the future. I think that there are so many promising ways to answer entirely new questions. And, but I think we need an ecosystem for biomedical science that supports the most creative and the most innovative science. And I think we have allowed the vision of Vannevar Bush to deteriorate to a certain extent and what we as a community, because this will only happen if the community comes together, we as a community need to really rethink what the 21st century version of the endless frontier is going to look like. We would urge all of you who are watching this video to go to the National Academy website that, uh, that um, carries our article, an open access form, and provides uh, authoring tools for you to tell us what you think about what we had to say there and what you think about uh, conditions for doing science in this, in this uh, remarkably uh, propitious time for achieving new discoveries and making progress against disease, uh, even under the conditions of fiscal restraint that are currently upon us.